Thanks for tuning in to Stay Sharp with Razor Leaf, your secret weapon for all things digital and products and manufacturing. This episode features a conversation between our podcast host, Jonathan Scott, with Razor Leaf's head of products, Tim Nose, where they delve into the complexities of integration in modern business environments. They focus on the importance of data flow, processing needs, and the evolution of integration solutions. They discuss highlights and challenges of building a digital thread, the role of middleware, and the necessity of both synchronous and asynchronous integration, as well as emphasize the need for scalability and flexibility in integration architecture. Tim also shares his experiences when developing Razorleaf's Clover platform. Let's listen in. So Tim, I'm glad we're sitting down today because I know one of the things we've been wanting to talk about for a while and get to on the podcast is, you know, what do we see from an integration perspective that's important to have sort of in your tool belt, um, in your experience, to be able to build out digital thread integrations, right? And as our as our product guy, as the guy responsible for Clover and our integration platform, I, I want to talk about that. Can we I, can we dig into that today? Certainly, and, and thanks for having me again. So uh, you know, it's exciting to sit down and and start to talk at a little deeper level about uh, about the things we're doing about about data and, and where, you know, integration and how all the challenges that we faced and how we ended up with uh, the, our integration platform and what the pros and cons of, uh, of what our customers face. Uh, right. You know, I, and I can't wait to dig into this because it, you know, so many customers come to us with questions about integration that, you know, why isn't it this simple or what, you know, isn't a digital thread just a series of integrations, those kinds of things. So, I'd love to just jump in and dig into like, okay, so what does integration look like? What, what do we see most often? So to me, the things I wanna talk about, I wanna just talk about, you know, what what did we do with Clover? How did we arrive where we arrived, right? I mean, cause I remember back in the day doing consulting projects, people were asking for, you know, what you look at now is like simple things. I don't wanna enter a bill of material in ERP if I've already entered it in PDM, if I already made it in CAD, that kind of thing. So, I mean, is that where some of this starts? It, it did, and uh, I, th- I think you always start with the, with the simple. There's one specific use case or need that uh, that a department or two departments right. have that uh, share information without having to rekey, right? So right. that's that's a big part of it, and e- eventually it turns into something bigger when you're starting to look at cross the enterprise workflow and those kind of things. Uh, but you start with something simple like that. I don't want to rekey data or I need a good way of importing data. That's, okay. that, that can be a starting point. Right. I'm exporting and I have this Excel spreadsheet and I need to get that data into this system mm. so I can use it. Well, so that, that probably brings up some of the things that you deal with that gets you just incrementally more complex, right? Because what you're doing in the spreadsheet, maybe you could code that I mean, is that, did that come up for us? Just move here to there was one, but then it was move, manipulate, and then put in there. Oh, sure. Okay. You, know, you don't think of how much human processing there is until you start to have those conversations. Mm-hmm. Well, it's not just a data load. The person who's building that spreadsheet or changing that spreadsheet or has some sort of an operation associated with the spreadsheet. Right. And that's when, when you start to look at the data exchange those are the types of operations that that you end up uh, automating and possibly putting in the middle between the two systems, right? And essentially um, emulating that human behavior, right? And that's I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb and talk about a couple of reasons why I think that is. And you tell me, you know, yeah, is that right? And what am I missing? You know, one thing that you end up doing there is the data just needs to look different in the two systems, right? I mean, we could be talking about a bill of material. And let's assume for a minute that we all know what a bill of material looks like, how it behaves, how it's structured. There's still gonna be nuance between where it's coming from and where it's going to, right? Well, certainly it could be a nuance. It could just be systems have different types or different lengths of data, right? Um, except different, you know, different uh, uh, structures for the data. Mm-hmm. But it could also be that the data itself, that the usage of that data is is really just a representation of the data. Right, so you might need to simplify it? Sure, example. so okay. we, you mentioned a bomb. Right. So a bomb to an engineer is much different than a bomb to a procurement person, for sure. example, yep. right? Because the procurement person wants to flatten it so they can order quantity and, and do those kinds of things. Uh, that's a great it's the same data. Right? There's math, right? That, that flattening a bomb 
is an algorithm that you want to apply. And if you want it to look one way in system X and a different, and it comes from looking a different way in the first system, yeah, why not, right? All right, I'm gonna flatten this thing. Every level of indenture I have, I'm gonna multiply the quantity times the higher level quantity. I'll get a total quantity, and now I've got a parts list. Exactly. But you knew how to do it algorithmically, and I assume that's the kind of thing people were asking us for in the middle. It is, or the okay. opposite of that, Jonathan. So, in, you know, you get to manufacturing execution system. They want to identify potentially every screw, every the location of every screw, or at least every serialized component, right, right. and where it sits in the uh, in which piece of the assembly, so mm, that they can okay. they can track that thing. So it's it's much more granular. Uh, so well, and that's that's a tricky problem, isn't it? Right. If it you if problem. you want to go from granular to summarize it, that's straightforward. Yeah. But this, and again, correct me if I'm wrong. This is where you get as a really interesting integration work because maybe system A has got most of the details, but it's summarized. You want to bring it over here to manufacturing, for example. But system B has a different set of details, and you need to do this That's before right. you put it over there. Okay. Quite frequently. Or everything is in system A, but some of the data is stored as metadata, and other might be CAD representation uh -huh. in a different okay. area of the system, right? Okay. So, so you know, piecing that together, getting all the superset of data that you need and then shaping it appropriately for the destination can be tricky. Right. And and you start asking yourself beyond that, what um, what files need to go along with that, what renditions, right. uh, you know, those kind of things. So you might need file conversions or you might need to take metadata and turn it into file so that that representation of that metadata can be delivered in a different format, so, not necessarily through a machine. So I want to dig into one that you said that makes me think of a conversation we had with another, another friend of ours on a different podcast, right? Talking about being model-based. And one of the challenges today, when you think about integrating data, is you might have some representations that are metadata, like you said, other representations that are inside of a file. Right? Lots of the model-based work that happens today, to your example, you a great example, I think, of manufacturing data. I need to know which bolt I'm trying to put into which hole. Not that I've got 26 bolts. All right, that's good. I got the right quantity ordered. That's helpful when I'm moving data across systems to know I need to order 26. But when it's time for MES to talk to PLM and say, this bolt, those, this one out of the 26 is too short, too long, whatever, to have those two systems talk to each other, you need, say, an instance ID. An instance ID, you're not necessarily gonna get from a bill of material or a parts list. That's right. You're gonna have to get that from the CAD data and the model data. And so to do, like you were just saying, to do some of this sharing of data across the digital thread, we've gotta take what one data set or system knows, put it together with what another one knows, to get it to a third or the reverse, right? Or, or the reverse or somewhere in the middle, shape the data in such a fashion that you can uh, add those types of things, you know, add add the logic to build those other data elements out or, or related elements out so that it's it's usable at its destination. So I wanna take this to, to why, uh, you know, Clover looks the way that it looks, right? Why when we, when we think about, um, you know, what we put together as a product to help do some of this, mm -hmm. I think what you're getting at, right, I mean, as I understand it, is if you're going to apply logic in transit, if you're going to do multiple points pulled together, multiple data sets to then turn into, to send to a third one, or one data set and split it, or any of those kinds of operations, you've got to do something in the middle. It's not passing data anymore. It's more than that. Agreed. There's, and there's two elements there, right? There's flow. Right. So it's it's the direction and, and the combination and the and the distribution of data, and then there's the business rule side of that, which right. is I need to I need to process that data. I need to do something with it, um, either before it's transferred, you know, when it's transferred, or somewhere in, somewhere in between. Right. And so I I think that's you know that's a challenge as uh, for a lot of companies that think that integration is simply move a part from A to B. Right, right. right. It, move a file, move some move, data, move, that's it, right? And that, that's all I'm doing. And, and I've had customers tell me, you know, why is this complex? I'm just trying to move a label, right? But then when you look at the state of the label that needs to right. go on that on that assembly at the at the end of the process and, and the label's changing as well and there's 
the label becomes obsolete in a source system, for example, right. you've got to be able to pick the right data. How do you handle that and let the destination system know and the, the floor know not to use this label because it just went obsolete when, right. know, when whatever change occurred that caused the update. To, to your point, if you want to apply logic that normally was applied by humans, like, oh, don't grab that one, grab that one, because yeah. that one's out of date or whatever, then to apply that logic, you need somewhere to apply that logic. That's right. Right. And so your choices are source system, right? destination system, or somewhere between. And that gets us to, okay, when we started looking at how we would integrate things, you know, I'm sure we did tons of projects. I remember back in the day where it was just connect source to target. That was it. And, and you picked one language or the other, that kind of thing. And, and as you, to your point, as you get more complex and you need to do things in the middle, you start to say, wait a minute, is that really the right way? Right. And, and we call that point to point, right? You have two points. You have your source and destination. You have no middle. Right. So you had to code all your logic at one end or the other. That's not scalable. It's not. It's it creates a number of problems. Right. Right. It's simple to do for the most part. Right. You know, you're still writing software, so it's not <laughs> not always simple. Yeah, yeah. Trust me. Um, but um, but you, you take out a lot of the power. Right. You have to run it on a system that may already be taxed. You know, yep. may already be underperforming, may already be too complicated. You have to use that system, you know, the either the source system or destination systems, developers who have, might have different languages, different skill sets, uh, you know. I remember these problems, right? I remember oh, yeah. you, you tried to run it on a on a PDM machine that maybe was housing the CAD tool because you needed to do something, but then nobody could use that machine or the, the PDM operation slowed down. I know what you're talking oh, about. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the... All, the persistent problem, which is when you present the two teams, the source system, say PLM, and, and the destination system, say ERP, and you present those those teams with the opportunity to build out an integration, they'll fight each other over who gets to do it, right? Right, right. <laughs> right. Or, or no, everybody doesn't Nobody want to do it. Yeah, problem, one of the two, right? right? Right. And so, but some it becomes somebody's problem. It becomes somebody's problem to initially create and then to maintain it over time. Mm -hmm. And then to evaluate the impact of uh, an endpoint upgrade, right. system upgrade on that code, and to go back into a dev cycle and do all these kinds of things. And that's where the evolution of, of uh, integration has really, really took a turn. Right. From let's not make all these point-to-point -point connections trying to create a spider web of data exchange, trying to orchestrate which one executes at which time. Well, let's use a middleware piece uh, with um, APIs at the boundaries. Okay. So that, so that. And this is how we got to our approach. It, it is, okay. it really is. So that's, yep. that's the essence of how we started to build our integration platform. We had a lot of use cases and, and we, we done integration every which way. We right. still occasionally do a quick point sure. to point for sure. whatever the appropriate purposes. We, you know, we do federated looks into other systems and yep. don't move data. You know, we, we do a lot of different things, but uh, yeah, when we when it came down to it, um, we knew we need, had to move files and data between systems. We knew we needed to process the files and data in the middle, oftentimes creating those renditions we talked about or, or changing things. Sometimes it's not even source to destination. The source and destination might be the same. For example, okay. yeah. for example, uh, uh, product changes category and its related document needs to change. Something like, yeah. something like, um, this just became more secure. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a fun one. That's a fun one, right? So something that was in general design, the next engineer, you know, goes through an approval process and whatever, and, and now we want to add that information and take the product to a, to a, some sort of a sensitive state. Right. Uh, and this is a use case we've worked on. Yeah, well, we've got plenty of regulated <clears throat> regulated industry customers, defense, et cetera. This comes up plenty. It comes up plenty. So the product change, there's all these documents associated with the right. product that now have to be designated with some sort of a stamp, yeah, right. watermark, or it's cover page time, it's stamp time. That's right. It's, yeah. And so, so you might, upon that triggering event, which is the recategorization of that product, you go find the related documents, you pull them, pull them out of the system, add that. Mm -hmm. Add that cover page, add that watermark, write the metadata in, potentially put it in a different store, bring right. it back into the system. Yep. So you know, those are the kinds of things that that having uh, an integration platform like 
our Clover platform that can also do job processing right. brings you. Yeah. So we're, that's not that's not a simple, you know, anybody, anybody can pass, just like point to point is easy. Anybody can pass some data about a part between two systems, right? There's modern REST APIs to do those kinds of things. But right. those aren't the use cases we run into. Right. We run into business problems, flow problems, data problems um, that that we're asked to solve that are much more complex than just sharing bits of information. And, and then this is what digital thread development is about, right? I mean, digital thread, as your people are building it out, it's rich with data, but that means it's rich with data in different data models, different systems, et cetera. And that's the challenge people are faced with. It's one of the, the places I think where we see but what we have as A, an integration platform, but B, as a job processing platform built into an integration platform is the kind of thing you need to build out that thread, right? Certainly. Because it's not as simple as let me pass data or let me let me you know surface data in a dashboard. It's not that. It's more than that, right? It is more than that. Let's go back to that exa that same example. I've got a product which has you know, parts and bombs mm -hmm. associated with it, and it has documents associated. With it. I just talked to you about about adding a cover page. Mm -hmm. Maybe that cover page has ITAR uh, requirements, sure. handling handling requirements on it. Where's that information stored? Is unlikely to be stored in the same engineering system that we picked up the original document and and the uh, and the product information from. Right. It's probably from a controlled source being written by some other department yeah. somewhere else that has you know save it out on SharePoint or somewhere. That, so you got to now you've got two sources of information that you got to go get the data from, consolidate it, process it, and then put it back in or, or put it wherever it needs to go. That's right. right. Pass it downstream. So, so, you know, looking at those kinds of, of use cases, um, you build that the true thread is that the product, the document, the even potential, um, uh, ITAR security information or legal legalese right. that's sitting somewhere else. That's the real threat here, right? Mm -hmm. They may not be related at this point in time, but at some point in time in the future, they may very well be related in a thread of information. Right. So, you know that, and, and you take that example and you you know go all the way down through. All right, now we've got definition, design, and specification, and and now you start looking at procurement and manufacturing and the history, the mm -hmm. the history of not only the product itself, but the operations, the the environment it was manufactured in, uh, you know, the machining that was used to do it, all of that, all of these components that really make up the true digital thread, are, uh, you know, they're all related in, in, in a digital thread that creates a definition of the product that is beyond the design. So it reminds me of, of one of the use cases I think we've seen plenty with customers where they've said, look, I want to be more model-based. And one of the tenets they follow as they go to be more model-based is they make their data more granular in whatever system they're using to manage it, right? So the model contains just the, the geometric data, the GD&T, whatever that might be. But then, you know, they're making a part of a specific material with a specific coding, those kinds of things. And so that data is in a document, right? That data is in a note, that data. And so these are separated out because we're gonna reuse that material note 100 places. We're gonna reuse that paint note, you know, those kinds of things. But then you end up with the problem of, now they need to translate what inside their four walls is very workable and logical for them. They got a PLM that connects it all, right? Um, they've got to translate that to purchasing, to your point. Downstream, they need to use it somewhere, but they need a way to put it all back together to say, all right, I want to give you a package. I want to give you some kind of output that ties together the pieces of the thread that someone downstream needs. This is that same processing problem, right? You've got to have something to apply that logic it is to give you what you need. It is, and so having having an integration platform, having having the right architecture, you know, putting in putting in a hub and spoke kind of architecture where we make all the connections to all the systems we need to connect to, and then we orchestrate mm -hmm. uh, orchestrate the information exchange, the extraction, the what transformation, the shaping, the processing, applying the business rules, doing data validation, all of those types of things um, as part of the overall flow that we're going to create for for that uh, for that product or that element or that data okay that makes sense
So I want to I want to key up on something you said, and just go again back in history a little bit, right? Because I'm talking with lots of folks, lots of IT folks. I get lots of questions about how we do integration, right? How do we do it? What do we leverage? That kind of thing. And you know, you get questions about what about software X, software Y, and approach X or Y. There are some things that in getting there, we probably didn't do. Is there any of that that you could sort of you know well some things that we we didn't do or couldn't do or didn't think was the right fit that are worth sort of mentioning that people commonly come to us and say, well, why not do X? There, there are some elements that, that we don't find quite as important as others. So um, off the top of my head, the, the no code or mm -hmm. low code pitch. Right. That's, that's great if you're doing that simple integration that we talk about where you, I can pick some pick an object and a few attributes from the source and map it to, right. uh, assuming that it has the same object and attributes. It sort of speaks to maturity, right? right. If, if it's that mature that anybody can do it, then maybe that's an okay approach. Then, then the zero, co low, no code, low code approach and platforms, they're great at that. Right. Lightweight integration, passing some data back and forth, right? We, we do support some of that, mm -hmm. um, but only really as a basis for getting to uh, solving the the true digital thread problems, okay. which are which include all the processing of that information, right. applying business rules, and, and validating uh, security and a, any anything else that you can think of that might be part of part of the life of that product data. Yeah, but you're not saying that like mapping has to be hard and you have to do it all with code. That's not your point. Your no, point no. is just if you only have no code, low code mapping you're not gonna be able to tackle some of the cases you're gonna run into. That's right, so our focus, okay. our, and, and our focus was, anybody can do the 80%. Right. That is easy. And, and it's probably, you know, it's 50 to 80%. That, it's, it's gonna be pretty easy. But when you get to that- That last other, 20. That last 20 to 50%, uh, it complicates things. Because right. you need to consider things you didn't consider in your integration before. Okay, adding that cover page and recreating it as a, addition to mm -hmm. as a addition to PDF or maybe a 3d PDF or whatever that is right that's a long-running operation and you start to do that over and over now you introducing performance characteristics into systems now you really want that hub because you don't want your PLM you system, want system, ERP system, system doing it yeah. having them spin up spin up and generate PDFs all day long right, right? so so you introduce a lot of a lot of other factors when you get to that that complexity yeah, and that's where, you know, I, I feel like it's good for us to talk through this and for, for people to understand and appreciate some of that thought process that went into how we got where we got to. Because if you don't think about that up front, to your point, you can get to the 80% and then you can never get the last 20 done because of whatever right. approach you took at the beginning. And, and looking back, you know, it's, it's interesting because uh, we didn't set out to build an integration platform. Right. We set out with a bunch of PLM and ERP and MES consultants, manufacturing consultants, with it, helping customers and running into problems right. and not collections of use cases. Collections of use cases, cases that couldn't be solved with anything on the market. We were looking around. We've tried integration platforms and iPaaS systems right. and low-level data exchange mechanisms, but we we were always left wanting. Right. And so we always had to code these elements anyway in order to make that operation occur properly right. across, across the enterprise. So um, what we did was collect all of, all of those use cases and sometimes the code that went along with them and, and built a framework. We ended up with an integration platform because we, wanted, we needed to solve that 20% and we were solving it with each new Right. Each new client, each new challenge, each new use case. In a lot of ways, you could look at Clover as it was sort of our evolving toolkit for solving the use cases that we had seen to the point where we said, wait, you know, the toolkit is ready made for doing some things just out of the box. You're That's just right. ready to go do it. But, oh, it's still got that toolkit aspect that when you need to get the other 20%, it's there. That's right? right. We built that into the architecture. That's right. We're into our 15th year, really. Of wow of where Clover is. It wasn't until six or seven or eight years ago, marketing found out what we were doing and got a hold of it and 
gave our platform a name, right? right? But it was a toolkit for our consultants to go in with a code base to solve these problems, right? To be able to create those those PDFs, to be able to manipulate data in a certain way, to be able to parse hierarchical data out right. of the source system, things that are tough, validating that, that the items are downstream before you try and place a bomb into a system that doesn't even have the children parts loaded. You know, those kinds of things, right? Those kinds of those kinds of elements of sequencing, mm -hmm. uh, looping operations, uh, well, this is long all running stuff, processing, right? This is all the stuff that uh, that I find myself talking with with clients about, with other people about, when you know they're they're curious why this is so challenging, what the issues are, and we talk about the character of the data with them, right? It's that kind of thing that if you understand how the data behaves, then you understand the need for these certain tools, methods, all these things that you have to bring to the table to responsibly move the data or access or merge or blend or do whatever you need to do with the data, that's tricky. And if right. you don't have the right tools in your toolbox, well, understanding the data is one thing. Working with it appropriately is another. That's right. And, and the character of the data, I love this concept, right? Because it introduces not only um, consideration that the data is spread out and distributed and probably among a lot of different systems as we talked about before mm -hmm. that changes over time right it's and very dynamic time becomes an element in this and it's often ignored mm -hmm. it's often ignored everybody looks at the pro point problem today and says oh i just need to move data from point a to point b well, as the systems change, as the requirements change, as the rules change, as the flow needs to change, because you're introducing new things into your business or into your product or into, right. you know, into your organizational um, processes, that integration may need to change. Right, it has so to that, keep up, right? Because, yeah. like you said, any number of those things change may influence the data on one end or the other or the multiple places it needs to come from, much less how it's processed in the middle, rules, logic, any of that stuff. And it can be as simple as you know a business change, That's some right. kind of regulation change, whatever it might be. But if you're not able to go in and sort of adapt, I think is your point. That's right. Yeah. And so, so, you, so when we were building our platform, we looked at these challenges. We looked at the long-running jobs. We looked at we looked at the fact that we know change is mm -hmm. imminent. <laughs> so, you know, there, there's going to be change that's going to be introduced at some point, and we really looked for an architecture to where we could make these elements. They're not no code, low code, but they're managed code. They're managed code that is modular in nature that you can build into sequences mm -hmm. and flows okay. and and change over time and if if we have to insert a validation step because something changed or we need to swap that one out to swap out that operation that's pushing it to system a and and push it to system b because i've just changed my my destination those kind of things are all pluggable so th this is what you mean by managed code i get it right so i'm gonna i'm gonna put an example like you said with validation you got step a is pull the data out Step B is transform it. Step C is put it in the other system, right? But then you say, oh, wait, hold on. We need to add a validation step. Well, if I can insert that as a step that's modular, right? That's right. Then tomorrow when that validation changes, I can swap it out for a different one. But that's your right. point is the whole overarching orchestration can stay the same. The endpoints of the systems I'm connecting to can stay the same. It's just the one piece. And that's, that's right. what you're getting at. That's what I'm getting at. Okay. So imagine you, you started with a point-to-point -point operation and you're passing a bill of materials and then you realize quickly that you that code is failing right. because the children weren't, weren't available or weren't, whatever. Weren't, yeah. weren't in this destination system, right? Or, or the units of measure don't match or the plant number isn't there. You know, those kinds of things happen. And so you, you have to build that validation and that logic in. Um, and, and so you have to either rewrite and update that point-to-point -point connector or have a platform that is pluggable that you can insert that step, step right. to do that kind of to thing. To your point, if it's point-to-point, -point, you're ripping out all the code, fixing the code, and replacing that whole piece of code. That's right. Where if it's pluggable, it's maybe you even keep running and you switch over, these jobs are now gonna run with this task plan instead of that task plan. That's, That's right. Thing. You're starting okay. to see the advantage of having a platform over doing that easy point to point. Right, right. It's easy up front, mm -hmm. but now we've talked about, oh, the system endpoints could change and that causes you to rewrite. Um, the, pro the business process might change or data might need to be validated or something new is introduced to one endpoint that breaks it and you're rewriting and republishing and doing all those kinds of things. So, so that, uh, that element of it is um, 
that element of it is a natural progression from what you might do initially when, right. you, when you need to feed some data to truly having a, a digital thread of information and, and uh, um, a more mature integration architecture. So let me take another one that I hear as a challenge that comes up in integration, right? And that's the difference between synchronous and asynchronous, mm -hmm. right? So I know we've done both, we've heard plenty of needs for both, but is, I mean, is it possible to do both in the same platform? I mean, how do we deal with that today? It is, and, and for, for our listeners who don't know synchronous and asynchronous. Good point, we should back up a little. Yeah, let's take half a step back. So uh, synchronous being real-time communication, right? right. I'm in my PLM. I'm I'm, in my PLM. I need a part number. I click the button. I need to grab it from ERP, but I, I'm waiting. I'm don't, waiting. Don't for take the ten result. minutes to give it to me. That's no. right. So I need to I need to respond to that request immediately to satisfy a waiting user or right. a waiting operation. Right. Asynchronous um, being, I could make a PDF in the background, and whenever it gets in there, it's fine. That, that's right. Yeah, right. Okay. So you know, I think probably eighty to ninety percent of use cases are asynchronous in nature. Right. right. But we do, you know, there. I think 80 to 90 percent of use cases are probably asynchronous in nature in that the user can continue an operation you have an ec release and that part information needs to be passed down or files need to be created or generated or exchanged most of it's asynchronous but there are very specific use cases where you need real-time information um, and we've run into those a number of places um, the waiting for a part number yep. is absolutely one of them I can almost guarantee it's not 100%, but it is near 100% of the time your ERP system is going to be your part number master. It's your it's your system of truth because that part is tied to financial information in that ERP system. So right. This gets into a whole well, CM2 you, conversation right? or part identification, but it's exactly right. Right. So your engineering staff, yes, they want to introduce part numbers into the system, but uh, the, it's not quite that easy right. because uh, they have to be tied to... Uh, tied to financial aspects and sources and things. That, well, it's what a lot of organizations, I mean, this is off on a tangent, but lots of organizations take the time to evaluate the cost of a new part number by looking at the overall cost of the organization over time. When we add one, what does it cost in warehousing and material costs, sourcing costs, all these things? And yeah. they say, one well, new part number costs this, so they put a few controls maybe on getting a new part yeah. number. And and there are other, you know, there are other areas where real-time uh, information can be very valuable. If, if you're object type is video, for example. You want to stream that. You can't have an asynchronous connection. It doesn't work so well. No, no, you need a connection-oriented stream of information coming back to coming right. back to the user, right? So there are, it might depend on object type, it might depend on, on uh, timing of uh, right. somebody Use waiting case, for flow, response. whatever it might be. Yeah, so it's it's important that the platform su supports, uh, you know, both of those types of things. So in ours, we, you know, built in real-time proxies so we can bypass the queuing. That queuing for the asynchronous is important, by the way, because you want to make sure that that job completes, and if not, that the that rainy day is handled and that scenario triggers something. That you something. can go back and re-trigger the job to get it re -trigger done. Re-trigger the job, fix it, yep. you know, and, and we build in a bunch of caching and logic that is, you know, turned on optionally where you can go fix errant data or, or uh, you know, and resubmit from there. Imagine, imagine a big release process mm -hmm. where an ECO goes through a month of approvals waiting for whatever executives or get up, get back from vacation and do their part and vote that thing through and you get this all done and then you then you it triggers a data release downstream to right. ERP for planning and MES for, for manufacturing planning, those kinds of things. And for some reason it fails. Right. Somebody changed a password on the destination right. system, right? The fifth parted line fails, we gotta right. fix it or whatever. Yeah. Do you have to, you have a couple of choices. You could try and code that in the source system to figure out if that data completed or not. Difficult to do, right? right. Very difficult. You can ask for a re release of that E C there's a whole lot of human effort involved in that right? time and yep. dollars, yep. right? That's that is not something you want to do. So that queuing and that orchestration and that that being able to validate that the operation completed, that the data is, is right. where it needs to be, and, and or recover if it didn't recover right. if it didn't be able to reprocess, pick up, fix fix the password, hit reprocess, right. and, and have the operation go through. You know, those are the kinds of things that have an integration platform. But that I think you brought up a great point in there that. 
the ability in one integration platform to do both, to say, I've got all of the capabilities and techniques I need to do the real-time piece, and I've got all the capabilities, supporting logic, facilities, all these things to do the asynchronous piece, great. So, the, and the reason we have this is we've had both use cases, so we needed to cover both. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, you know, and, and you start to think things, think, so we're gonna get complicated now, we're gonna, we're gonna get fun. So now take this, we're talking about this as if these systems are all sitting between you and I. Right. Imagine if they're spread across the world and you're dealing with latency or you're dealing with local language or you're dealing with... Uh, dealing with... Security models. Security, <laughs> right? Um, different security models. Right. Uh, different security models, different identity providers for systems, those kind of things. So when you add that aspect to the character of this data, mm -hmm. Um, you start to you start to realize that it's not quite that easy, right? It's not quite that easy, and and you might want to distribute the processing of this to local vaults or to local local uh, geographies. You might want to scale. You might need to scale. So you know, as we as we took that code that we built for all these use cases and turned it into a framework, we made all these considerations. Now, we're going to have to scale up and scale out as necessary to to uh, achieve performance uh, requirements or to distribute systems to local geographies. Uh, you know, and this is the kind of stuff that went into the architecture and the design of the platform, right? That's right. I mean, when we were working on, well, yes, we've got a lot of things we've done. We have a nice toolkit, but how do we put that together in a way that is the best package that's reusable, that covers the simple case, right, in a right. non-complex way, but yet can scale out and is modular, scalable, extensible, all those things to the complex cases you were just talking about. Right. That that's what we had in mind. Yeah? It it is. Okay. It, not necessarily in mind. I'd love to I'd love to tell you I, I had an, an a moment was, of enlightenment and I sat down it and it was all part of the master wow, plan. Yeah, but, master okay. plan. No, but it was lessons learned over these over these decade plus of, right. of doing this, right? And and uh became pretty obvious so so we made changes and we continue to improve and we continue to add things to the platform we, we do today so, right you know there there um there are a lot of elements of this that that will change and having a platform architected like ours uh, that we can update frequently that we can you know we're getting the underlying architecture now where um where we can deploy things rapidly and add new features and extend the plugins, the capabilities to connect to new systems, even homemade, homegrown systems and things like that. Right. That's, that's all important in building, um, building an environment that will be there 10 or 20 or 30 years from now. You're as. getting at the pieces of like, well, we, we understood what the suite of capabilities needed to be and how they needed to work together. But to your point, then as we started to bring that together, we also recognized the things that would make it easy to deploy, easy to update, easy That's to right. change, because we knew, to your point, the product was an evolution of That's right. what we saw in the real world, and we know it's gonna to continue to evolve. So how can we be yeah. efficient about that? Yeah, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. So we knew right off that we needed to be able to let clients write their own code or be able to, to add, right. these, add these methods to do all these different things that we know we're going to be asked, but we don't know that they are yet. I know one of the areas that, that we focused on was just the deployability of the solution, right? The ability to deploy a solution that could be scaled up, which could be scaled out, could be easily managed, could be modular in terms of how our engine worked, right? So, you know, Tim, talking about all this, it's it's clear to me whether it's Clover or not, right? Because we're, we're using Clover as an example, but right. I think, you know, the general conversation is what have we learned about integration and building out digital threads for people that we know is important, whether it's our integration platform or someone else's, and there's lots of lessons we've learned. Right? There is. I mean, that's that's what really I'm hearing from what you're telling me. It is, and you know, I, I get questioned all the time, why is Clover different? Well, I told you a little bit today about why it's different, because we, we came at it from a different approach to solve things that were difficult to solve with other platforms. But that weren't getting solved by some of the ones that were on the market. But, but the truth of it is, Razorleaf is different, right? Because we bring the, that knowledge, that skill on integration, on digital thread, on digital twins, and and flow, and and it's major. the pattern recognition. It's, it's the, the pattern use recognition. Cases we've seen use cases we've right. seen, and that's what's driven the platform that we put together to uh, to be what it is. 
So other plat, you know, you can acquire another platform. You may have to build it from build that from ground up. You you right. still need that expertise in order to do those kinds of things. So our focus on in design engineering and manufacturing um, has really given us something unique in the marketplace. Right. Thank you for being here and listening to this episode of Stay Sharp with Razorleaf. If you have any questions, please just leave a comment on our post or send us an email to podcast at razorleaf.com. We'd love to hear from you. And if you like this podcast, please hit the like button and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform or on our YouTube channel. Until next time, stay sharp.